better looking than that, Jack. <laughs> if somebody doesn't like going to church, what makes them think they'll like going to heaven? I mean, it's a good day. We, we had a great day today. We've had, uh, we've had some physical meals this week, but we've had a whole lot of spiritual feast. We're thankful for it tonight. We've had a great day today, and uh, we ought to all be feeling good. We ought to feel good about being a Christian. It's the greatest life in all of the world. A lot's been said about these young people, and I, I love these little young people as well, and they're right up here. And, you know, we've seen quite a few generations grow up during the lectureships here, and uh, I'm sure these young folks are going to turn out the ones back there as well and throughout the audience here, that they're going to turn out like a lot of the other young people who grew up in the lectureships here. Uh, I know that uh, a lot of the young people that used to sit, well, some of them sit right over here when the tellers are over here and all of that. We remember even where they sat. And they have become great Christian mothers and great Christian wives. They have become Bible class teachers and I'm pretty sure that some of the young ladies have even taught uh, ladies Bible class. And young men have grown up to be song leaders. And they've grown up, to, I think a couple of them have grown up to be deacons. And certainly some gospel preachers. And that's what we're looking for from these young people as well. And so it's wonderful. It's marvelous. We're developing. And all of us are developing. And these young people are developing as well. Well, tonight we want to talk about the challenge to strive for godliness. We want to be a God-likeness. We, we want to be like God. God wants us to be like Him. Because that's the greatest life in all the world. That's the greatest uh, being in, that exists is God. And so God wants us to be like Him. He wants us to be like His Son. His son is an example for us. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, For hereunto were ye called, because Christ also uh, left, suffered and left us an example, an example that we should follow in his steps. God wants us to be like his son. The next verse says, Who knew no sin, Neither was guile found in his mouth. So there it is. He's the example. What kind of example is he? He's an example of, of a sinless person. No guile was found in his mouth. So God wants us to be like his son. The Bible says in Matthew 5 and verse 48, Be ye perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. And so God is encouraging us and teaching us to be like Him, to be God-like. Godliness with contentment is not a little gain. It's a great gain, the Bible says, in 1 Timothy 6 and verse number 6. And we're, we're taught to live righteously and soberly and godly in this present world. God wants us to be godly and God-like. And so all of that uh, information is important for us. Philippians 2 and verse number 5, the Bible says, Have this mind, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We're to be like God. We're to be perfect like God is perfect, which means complete. We're to love our enemies and be good to those that persecute us. That's what that Matthew 5 passage is about. Matthew 5, 43 through 48. To be like God means that we are to... Be compassionate and merciful to our enemies. That's what it means to be God-like. To be God-like means that we eliminate sin from our lives. God says that He's Christ has died, leaving us an example. Christ is our example. Not Elvis. Not Jordan. Uh, you're not going to get to heaven by following them or some kid at school. Don't follow some kid at school. Follow Christ. Follow Him. And that's why we, we are to follow Him, to be like Him. Now, God is de developing us. God's developing us because we're, we're on a journey. We're going to heaven. We need to fit into heaven. 
People that are not like Christ will not fit into heaven. People who are not like God, who are ungodly, you're either godly or you're ungodly. If you're ungodly, you won't fit into heaven. There won't be a place for you in heaven. That's the value, that's the goal of being godly. So that we will classify, qualify to be in heaven. If some guy's trying to make a football team, and he's small, and he's slow, and he's not strong, guess what he does? He tries to get bigger. He tries to get stronger. He tries to improve his speed. He tries to qualify for the football team. We're trying to qualify for something greater than a football team. We're trying to qualify to go to heaven. And so we want to be a, a citizen in heaven. And in order to be a citizen in heaven, you have to have the qualifications or the characteristics to be a, a citizen of heaven. Not just anybody's going to get into heaven. Matthew 7 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Heaven's not for everybody. Heaven's not for everyone who says, Lord, Lord. But Jesus even says that in Matthew 7 and 21. He's trying to inform us. He's trying to educate us. Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Get that down. Open your heart. Open your Bible. Let's be sure that we're taking God's word seriously. Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. When you do the will of God, you're going to be God-like. You're going to have godliness. And that's what we're striving for. Judgment day is coming. You can be rejected. You can be rejected. That verse we were referring to a moment ago, Matthew 7. We, we stated verse 21. Now verse 22 says, Many will say unto me on that day, Lord, look at that, they're calling him Lord. Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? That's people who uh, pretended to be a Christian, I suppose. We've prophesied in your name. We've cast out devils in your name. We've done many wonderful works in your name. But they didn't qualify. For he will say unto thee, them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So you can miss out on heaven. People who are not God-like and have godliness will not be able to enter into heaven. So our lesson tonight, as we bring a close to this uh, lectureship this year, our lesson tonight is a soul-saving lesson. It's a lesson about going to heaven. I know that you want to go there. You're not here because you're not interested. You're here because you are very interested. These young people are very interested. These older people. And we're pulling together. We're unified tonight. We're helping one another tonight. You know, one of the reasons why to get to heaven... And one of the reasons for the assemblies is to exhort one another. For not, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Why? Because tonight, tonight we're going to exhort one another so much the more as you, we see the day approaching. So we're here tonight to, to endeavor to cause ourselves to be more like God as I know you are trying to do. I know that's your goal and that's your motive tonight. Many of you have been here every day uh, during this lectureship. And you're here because you understand the value of your soul. You understand the truthfulness of the Bible. You understand the reality of eternity. You understand the gravity of the judgment day that we're all going to be participating in. We're going to be in that judgment day. And you understand that. And you realize in your heart tonight. And uh, in past days and past years, you realize that you need to be like God. So we're going to talk about that tonight. And we have three points in our lesson tonight. Number one, to be godlike is a transforming process. It is a transforming process. It is a process. And it is a process that involves the changing of our lives. A transforming process. Number two. We're going to look at the apostles as an example of people who were transformed. They were transformed. And then, finally, as time will allow us tonight, we're going to talk about the godlike attributes. 
Let's turn in our Bibles now to Mark chapter 1 as we discuss the first point, and that is it is a transforming process. In Mark chapter 1, Jesus is walking on the shores of the bank or the banks of the Sea of Galilee. And uh, he had started the, his public preaching at that time, as you see in Mark 1 and verse 15, and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come you after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. It is a process. Now, one of the things that uh, uh, to be godlike is to be a fisher of men, to be a seeker of the lost. Luke 19 and 10, the Lord said I, that, that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And so to learn God likeness is uh, to learn uh, the value of lost souls and to seek after them. But notice, I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little farther uh, thence, he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, uh, who also were in the ship mending their nets. And straightway, which means immediately, he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. Now, he said, I will make you to become fishers of men. Now, let's notice uh, these men for a moment. These men, if you'll look over to Acts chapter 4 and verse 13, these men are going to develop into godlike people. They have some developing to do. They have the most important work in all of the world to do. They're going to seek the lost. They're going to preach the gospel to the lost. But I want you to notice what kind of men Jesus chose. And he chose them deliberately. In Acts 4 and verse 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Now, their boldness and their courage to preach the gospel was a marvelous thing. But I want you to notice in that verse that even the public, even their enemies recognize something about them that you and I need to recognize too. That they were not schooled people. Jesus deliberately went along the seashore to pick out common, ordinary people to become apostles. Sometimes we think the apostles were so, uh, so above our level. They were elite, uh, spiritually elite people. No, they were not. They were people who had to develop into God-likeness. They were ignorant and unlearned men. Search your Bible, and you'll find that it's very common now, I believe that we're all common and ordinary people here. We have people from every walk of life, and that's good. That's who the gospel is for. And if you'll search your Bible, you will find that it's often the common and ordinary man that God sought to do a great work. David was, was only a little shepherd boy, a little shepherd boy. And he would tend those sheep out there all by himself in the wilderness all alone with his little sling. And like most boys, he would be out there hour after hour with nothing to do. And he would pick up a rock and put it in his sling. And he'd see a target and he'd hit a target with it. Or he'd try to hit a target. And he would develop his skill and develop the skill of the sling. And God used that common little boy, that little shepherd boy, and anointed him king of all of Israel. If you'll search your Bible, 
you'll find that Amos was a dresser of sycamore trees. You'll find that God used that man to deliver a great message to a mighty nation. And if you'll search your Bible, you'll find that Moses was born of the slaves of Egypt. And uh, he had spent 40 years just herding uh, livestock out in the wilderness. And God called these people. Now, these are pe all these people needed to be developed. All these people were not spiritually elite and uh, already developed people. They were not. The apostles were not developed people. They had to do some things in their lives to, to change. Now, conversion, uh, look at Acts chapter 3 and verse 19 uh, we're talking about godliness tonight, and godliness is a process. You've got to develop. In Acts 3 and verse 19, it says, Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. So there has to be a change. There has to be a conversion in order for our sins to be blotted out. Now, when a person becomes a Christian, the Bible says that they are babes in Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number one, as newborn babes seek a desire, the sincere milk of the word. We, when we're born in this world, we're born as little infants. Little infants that have to be held and have to be helped and attended to. And when we're baptized into Christ, we don't, we don't rise from the waters of baptism a full grown, fully godly Christian. We have to do a lot of learning. We have to have a lot of care. And so, be converted that your sins may be blotted out. And realize that this uh, matter of becoming God-like is a process. And I've always loved Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And this really teaches us a lot about godliness. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice. You know what Jesus did? Jesus presented himself a living sacrifice. You know what God wants you to do? He wants you to present yourself a living sacrifice. We're, we're to be willing and ready, as, as uh, Brother Tony was addressing a minute ago, Revelation 2 and 10, we are to be willing to sacrifice ourselves even unto the dying for the cause of Christ as many people have already done before us, that they have committed themselves to dying. So we're to present our bodies a living sacrifice. And this is God-likeness, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. But verse number 2 says, And be not conformed to this present world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that uh, you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The word transform there, to be transformed, my understanding of that word is it's the metamorphosis. A metamorphosis is the word that's used when a caterpillar uh, spins a cocoon and he enters that cocoon, a little caterpillar, a little creepy fella. But when he comes out of that cocoon, he's changed. He's not creepy. He's not crawly any longer. He's beautiful. He has beautiful wings. And so there's the metamorphosis. Be not conformed to this present world, but be ye transformed into something wonderful and something beautiful to be God-like. And so uh, God-likeness, becoming a God-like person, is a process. It is a process. We need to understand that and appreciate that because we're going through that process now. And so we're, we're, we're going through that process. We're trying to improve our lives. I, I hope you won't ever get to a certain level of knowledge of the Bible and say, well, I've learned enough. I don't need to go to Bible class any longer. No, we can always increase. I hope you don't reach a level of... of uh, some level of purity you think well I don't have to become more pure that we'll just never reach that point that we'll never cease to need more purity in our lives more understanding more knowledge more wisdom 
And so it is a process that continues to go on. Now, let's talk about the apostles now as an example of their development of their godliness. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 14. You probably remember so well, and even the young children here know this account, of the disciples being in a ship, and there is a storm, and Jesus walks out to the ship and walks on the water. And so many people saw miracles back in those days, and they saw that. They saw it was a miracle. And so they, he was walking out uh, to the ship on the water. Verse 28, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou bid me come unto thee on the water. Verse 29, And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. So he was doing fine there for just a moment. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O oh, thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? He had a little faith, didn't he? He had a little faith because Jesus identified the fact that he had a little faith. Now this is early on in their development. When we're baptized into Christ, you know what? Our faith is little. Our faith is small. It's a development uh, process. And so Peter didn't have a strong faith. He did later on. But he didn't right there. And his faith was so small that he even endangered his own life. His own life was in danger. It looked like he would have said, yeah, I've got to keep my faith up to keep out of this water because I could die. But that's not what happened. Then, uh, so... Uh, he was very mature there, wouldn't he? He was immature. So let's go to Matthew chapter 16 now. Now on this occasion, you know very well, and you know this circumstance very well, that in verse 13, Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist. Well, that was a good thing, wouldn't it? He wasn't John, but that was a good name. And some, Elias, oh yeah, he was a great prophet of the Old Testament. Others, Jeremiah, oh, I love the book of Jeremiah. Or one of the prophets, and he said unto them, But whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. There was a man that uh, could get out of the boat, walk a little bit, but he went down in the water. There was a man who knew who he was traveling with. He was the Christ, the Son of the living God. By the way, right there in that point where they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist. You know, that was their interpretation. Some say you're Elias. That was their interpretation. Some say you're Jeremiah. That was their interpretation. But you know what? You can't have your own interpretation, can you? Because he wasn't John the Baptist, and he wasn't Jeremiah, and he wasn't Elijah. He could only be one person, and that's Jesus Christ. You can't have your own interpretation and say what you want to about the Bible. There's only one correct answer. But look at right after Peter said that, made a great statement, made a truthful statement, made a wonderful statement. You're the Christ. You're the Son of the living God. But look at verse 21. Right after that. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. And he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. You're a, thou, hast, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be a men. One minute he says, you're the Christ or the Son of the living God. The next minute, he's the adversary of Christ. Now these men had to develop. They were common, ordinary men, just like you and I. Just like I've had to develop. Just like I've had to grow in my knowledge of the Word of God. All of us, they did the same thing, just like you do. That's why we have Bible class. We've been sitting here all day, every day. Why? Because we want to grow. We realize we don't know enough. 
there's still something to learn. There's still something we need to be even reminded of. As Peter would often say, that I'm going to put you in remembrance of these things even though you know them. And so these men needed to develop. He wasn't strong. He had a weak faith. He began to even oppose Christ. Then look at Matthew chapter 26 when Peter began to re reveal something uh, really kind of shocking to them. In verse number 30, and uh, I like verse number 30, Matthew 26, because they did then what we did tonight. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. That's what we've been doing tonight. We've been doing just what Jesus and the apostles did, sung a hymn. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. You know what Jesus knew about these men? They were still developing. They were still growing. And he also knew this. He could correctly and accurately evaluate anybody. And he did it on many occasions. He evaluated people. He evaluates me. He evaluates you. And as he evaluated these people, these twelve, on the eve of his arrest and on the eve of his death, he knew they were still weak. Isn't that incredible? That he still, he knew these men had not developed yet. Because he says, you'll be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. That's what they all were. They scattered that night. But after I'm risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. You're going to be offended because of me tonight. But I hadn't lost, I hadn't lost confidence in you yet. Isn't that good? You, you may stumble. You may have a weak faith. You, you may sink down and get into trouble and have to cry out to the Lord. But listen, the Lord didn't lose trust in these men. He didn't lose confidence. That makes me feel so good. He says, but after I'm risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, look at this, look, look at this person who thought he stood. You know, the Bible warns us, uh, take heed um, to him that thinketh he standeth, uh, you, or lest you fall. Peter answered him and said unto him, though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Look at that. I'll never. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee this night, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise said all the disciples. But we know very well that very night, just a couple of hours or not very long, not maybe not even a couple of hours right after that, that they began to deny Christ. Look at... Uh, the end of this chapter, beginning in verse 69. Now Peter sat down in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. And he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. Well, that was a lie, wasn't it? Because he was with Jesus just a few minutes before. And so he's lying. You know what the Bible says about a liar? All liars will have their lake in the part that their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. This man committed a, a horrible sin right there. Why? Because he's weak. He's not developed yet. Just like we're trying to develop, we do make mistakes occasionally. And again, uh, verse seventy-one. And when and when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, "This fellow was." Uh, also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied uh, with an oath. I do not know the man. Do you remember what Matthew 10, 32 and 33 says? Jesus said, if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father which is in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father which is in heaven. This is dangerous territory that Peter now has entered into. He's lied. That's dangerous. He's denied his knowledge of Christ. 
and uh, that's very dangerous. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art also one of them, for thy speech betrayeth thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man, and immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now that was a grievous sin right there that, that Peter committed. Grievous! He'll lose his soul over that if he doesn't repent. But you know, Jesus didn't lose confidence in these men and trust in these men. Fifty days later, fifty days later on the day of Pentecost, on the celebration of the harvest, on that day they stood up in the midst of the city of Jerusalem, Acts 2 and verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, you men of Judea and all that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. And then he preached this great gospel sermon. You know, when Peter denied Jesus, Jesus didn't say, all right, you're out. I don't want you in my group, I don't, in, in this number anymore. You're out. He didn't say uh, to the other twelve, you're out. You've, uh, you've forsaken me. These were people who were developing spiritually they were developing godliness and they're going to fall and they're going to stumble and they're going to make mistakes just like you do and just like i have done and so the great news is that this person who denied christ who lied who cursed who swore with an oath was the man to preach the first gospel sermon following the resurrection of christ what a wonderful thing that is. Not only did they, but it wasn't Peter. Let's don't get to make the mistake that it was the power of the apostles. Look at Acts 2 and verse 37. Now when they heard this, it was the word. When they heard the word, it wasn't Peter all of a sudden who had this great faith. So his faith converted the people. His faith didn't convert the people. It was the word of God that converted the people and so he stood up and he had the courage to preach the sermon and in verse 41 it says then they that gladly received his word not received peter not received peter's faith or peter's god likeness when they gladly received the word they were baptized in the same day there were added to them about three thousand souls and so from that time forward they continued to preach the gospel in Matthew 5 and verse 28. And what we want to see in this, this part of our lesson is, the, the first point was that it's a process. God-likeness is a process. Point number two is the apostles went through that process. They're examples for us to let us understand we're going into a process of learning and developing. And so... <clears throat> In verse 28, they said, Did we not straightly command you that you should not teach in this name, nor uh, preach in this name? Behold, you fill Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. So the point is, they continued to preach the gospel. They developed, they developed spiritually. They did what God wanted them to do. And that's what God wants you to do. And so we've got to develop that godliness. Now, let's turn to Matthew 22 real quickly. Uh, I, think the, I think the points have been made, but uh, we, we would have to go ahead. What we'd like to do in this part of our lesson, and we only have a few minutes, is to talk about a few of the things that we should have in our lives as to be God-like. Now, there are many things, but we'll only talk about a few of them tonight. In Matthew 22, in verse number 37... Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first commandment. And the second is likened to this, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now there are certain things that we need to develop in our lives. And one of those things, one of those key things, is we are to develop the great and wonderful quality of love in our, in our lives. You need to develop that in your life. And that's, that's a challenge for us. To love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. Develop that. 
Listen, God is love. 1 John 4 and 8, God is love. You know what God wants you to do? He wants you to be loved too. He wants you to develop the same characteristic that he has in his life. God is love, and God wants you to have that love that he, what, that he is. He wants you to have it too. You're to love him with all your heart. He's loved you with the greatest love in all the world. John 3, 16, he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave you his love. Now he wants you to give him your love. Not only give him your love, but you give your love to others as well. To love your neighbor as yourself. That's God-likeness. And uh, there are many, many other things that we could talk about here this evening. But let's turn to Ephesians chapter uh, 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 4. Ephesians 4, I love this chapter of Ephesians 4 because it tells us to put off the old man and put on the new man. And that's, you read chapter 4 and you'll find out a lot about godliness. But verses 31 and 32, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Listen, if politics makes you angry and get into all a clamor, you better put that away. And be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. We've got to develop love in our hearts, love for our enemies, love for our brethren. If you don't love the brethren, you don't, you don't have the God-likeness in your life. If you don't love your neighbor, you're not like God. If you don't forgive one another, then you don't have that quality. Did you see what that verse says? Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You've got to be a forgiving person. If you're not, if you're a grudge holder, you're not, you don't have the God-like quality in your life that you need in your life. So many other things to talk about. But let's now go to the book of Revelation, chapter, chapter 20. What we're doing, beloved, and I know we've already stated this before, but I want to close our lesson tonight. What we're doing is we're preparing for heaven. And if you don't have God-likeness, if you're not godly, if you don't have the qualities that the Bible presents for you to have in your life, if you don't have the mind of Christ, that means if you don't have the morals of Christ, you don't have the ethics of Christ, you do not have the principles of Christ in your mind, then you do not have the mind of Christ. If you do not have the mind of Christ, guess what? What other kind of mind can you have? What other, what other alternatives are there if you do not have the mind of Christ? you got the mind of the devil. If you're unforgiving and you're unloving, you're just what the devil wants you to be. You are a citizen of hell. You're not a citizen of heaven. We're trying to qualify to be the citizen of heaven. We're trying to be approved just like the little skinny guy who can't run very fast and he's not very strong. He lifts, he lifts weights and he runs and he develops, he develops himself. That's what we've got to do. We've got to develop ourselves, read the Bible, obey the Bible, take the Bible into our heart so that we'll fit into heaven. Look at Revelation 20 and verse 14. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. That's what we're trying to avoid, being cast into the lake of fire. If we're not God-like, then there's only one other alternative. We're devil-like. If we don't have God's love, then we have the hate of the devil. If we don't forgive people like God, then we're grudge holders like the devil. If we don't have the characteristics and the mind of Christ in us, then we have the world in us. And then Revelation 21 in verse 8, but the fearful, that's not the qualities God wants in you. He doesn't want you to be afraid. Fear never did anything. Fear never taught a class. Fear never stood up for the truth. Fear never admitted Christ. That's why fearful is a bad thing. Fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and all idolaters and all liars, they don't fit into heaven. They shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death. We're trying to avoid that. Then look at Revelation 21 and verse 27. This is why we want to have God likeness. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's what we're striving for. 
We're striving to live the greatest life, the best life, the most noble life that could you could ever imagine. You know those apostles a while ago that we were talking about sank down in the water, withstood Jesus, denied Jesus. They preached that great gospel sermon and they helped many, many others go to heaven. That's what you can do when you become God-like. You can help many other people go to heaven as well. We've got to be like God. Now, we get all worried about this little old short life. You know, it was being discussed earlier that the world's about 6,000 years old. You know that Adam lived 930 years. Methuselah is 969. That's almost the sixth of the age of the earth. 6,000 years, they almost lived a thousand of it. But as long as they lived, it's nothing like eternity. Eternity is what we're going toward. Don't worry about the things in this world. Life is but a vapor that appeareth for a little time. Stop worrying about the things of this world and start preparing for eternity because that'll have no end. We get all worked up over this little short life here about having some earthly carnal pleasure here and we forget about the eternal bliss of heaven. Don't do that. Stay faithful. Strengthen your faith. Work on being a godly person. And we're going to get to heaven together, everybody in this room. I expect to see you in heaven. Many people that we've known over the years have already passed away that were faithful members of these local congregations here. We're looking forward to seeing them someday in heaven. We're going to make it to heaven. You, you better get confident about that. Because God is not going to lie and he's not going to break his promise. If we're faithful to him, just spoken tonight, Revelation 2 and 10. If we're faithful to him, he's going to give us a crown of life. You're going to get one. If you're faithful. Now, you may be here tonight and you're not faithful. We hope and pray that this opportunity right here, this your eternity may depend on what you do right now. We have a song just for you tonight, just for you to come forward if you need to. Most of the people here are members of the church, and you, you know whether you're ready for the judgment or not. If you're not, eternity may depend on what you do right now, right this second. Please come if you need to be restored to the Lord. Please come if you haven't been baptized for the remission of your sins. Please come if you need to study the Bible more and learn more of God's will as we stand and as we sing. Would